3.3 comparables. We're all trying to get ahead of the curve, thinking to ourselves, what are people going to pay for this stock a year from now? The PE multiple for all its limitations can give you a very crude indication of the market's expectations, of the expected growth and the amount of uncertainty or risk associated with that growth. Michael Corasaniti, Pico Capital. I'm often asked, what do analysts do in practice? Behind this question is the implication that this is what we want to know. In the 21st century, there is extensive information about listed firms available in many countries, including published financial statements, listed share prices, and extensive industry and economic information. We will consider how this information is typically analysed to assess the value of a firm. To see practice. We do not really know for sure what people do in practice. In some ways, it's a bit like asking people what they do in their bedrooms. If we ask someone, would they really tell us? There is a certain amount of information in the public domain about what people do in practice in analysing firms' financial statements. For example, there are many brokers' reports published, which typically use a range of methods to analyse a firm's financial statements and to value firms. Two examples of brokers' reports are GR Engineering and Saunders International in Australia. There are also other published reports, such as independent expert reports, that are required to be provided during certain takeover bids for listed companies. And here is an example of an independent expert's report. See page 120. Prepared by KPMG in relation to the takeover of Avio Group by Brookfield Group. These various published reports give some idea of the approaches to financial statement analysis that are used in practice. There have also been several published surveys and various public discussions over the years in which capital market participants have been asked what techniques they use when analysing financial statements. For example, one of the earlier surveys of analysts was in 1971, when Ralph Bing surveyed a range of capital markets participants in the US on the methods and te techniques used by those who are on the firing line and have to make daily investment decisions. As Bing pointed out, the person who is confronted with an unending chain of decision-making problems usually lacks the time to spell out their views in print and very often has other reasons for not publicising their evaluation technique. Nevertheless, a silent majority of portfolio managers and securities research heads occupy a key position in the continuous process of equity valuation, because values are strongly influenced by those who do the actual evaluating and convert it into buying and selling decisions. Most respondents to Ralph Bing's survey indicated they used a range of methods and techniques based on analysing various types of price multiples of comparable listed firms. These multiples were applied to typically the earnings of a firm, usually adopting forecasts of earnings within a one to three year time horizon. There have been subsequent surveys that have tended to arrive at similar results. For example, a survey in 2006 by William Dukes, Zhuang Ming Peng and Philip English found that the analysts they surveyed typically each used about five different techniques to value shares and that an overwhelming majority, about three quarters, used current PE, price to earnings multiples, as a basic valuation technique, also often using future earnings with a one to two year time horizon, and sometimes normalized earnings, which is an attempt to adjust historical or forecast earnings for one-off or unusual items. And a survey of analysts in the US in 2013 by Lawrence Brown, Andrew Call, Michael Clement and Nathan Sharp found that the factors analysts believe are most indicative of high quality earnings include that earnings are backed by operating cash flows, are sustainable and repeatable, reflect economic reality and reflect consistent reporting choices over time. These surveys give us an idea of what people say they do in practice. 
I've also been a participant in the capital markets in Australia and New Zealand in various capacities for many years and have seen firsthand what I've done and what others around me have done in terms of financial statement analysis and equity valuation. I've also had various informal discussions with participants in our capital markets over the years. Typically, most individual analysts will use a few approaches to arrive at a view of the value of a firm. However, although several approaches may be used, analysts will usually place most reliance on a primary approach that is considered suitable to the requirements of the firm being analysed, with other approaches being used as a cross-check or reality test. The primary approach adopted by many analysts in Australia and New Zealand, and indeed in most capital markets of the world, tend to focus on the relationship between a firm's earnings or cash flows and listed share prices for comparable firms. Comparable firms. I personally don't spend a lot of time thinking about valuation and projecting cash flows. When taking our positions, we tend to ask ourselves what people are likely to be thinking about the business 18 months or two years hence. Steve Galbraith, Maverick Capital. A focus on multiples of comparable firms has the benefit of simplicity. We do not need to forecast aspects of a firm's performance for several years, which is difficult to do well. It also has the advantage of relying on the consensus market view of the value of comparable listed companies as the basis for forming a view of the appropriate value of a firm. Essentially, it leaves it to the market to carry out the challenging role of valuing comparable firms. The analyst simply assumes the market has this right. The thinking behind this is that the market reflects the collective wisdom of all investors and so should generally be better than any individual investor, particularly of an individual investor who has not done much digging or analysis themselves. Multiples for comparable firms can be calculated based on a range of measures. These can include the ratio of market capitalization, number of shares on issue times the listed share price, to either earnings, cash flows, sales, book value of equity, or book value of total assets. Although commonly used, in practice the use of comparables is not as straightforward and simple as it might seem. Like people, all firms are unique. All firms will be different from other firms in various ways and it is often difficult to identify appropriate comparable firms and to make meaningful comparisons. There is also a range of ways to calculate various ratios or multiples. For example, share prices used to calculate the P in a ratio such as a PE or price to earnings ratio are usually the latest available or recent share price, but could be average share prices over a recent period. Also, if PE ratios or multiples are being calculated, the earnings figure used is usually a firm's actual historical earnings, net profit after tax, from its latest financial statements, or alternatively estimated or forecasted earnings for the current year not yet completed. On occasions, normalised earnings might be used, which is an attempt to adjust historical or forecast earnings for one off or unusual items. Alternatively, a cash flow measure might be used instead of earnings, such as EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, tax, depreciation and amortisation expenses have been deducted. The PE multiples of comparable listed companies can be applied to the earnings of listed or private firms to obtain an estimate of their value. A firm might be valued by using a PE ratio based on an assessment of PE multiples of comparable listed companies, which ratio might be, say, 14 times, which we apply to its historical forecast or perhaps normalised earnings, say $10 million, to arrive at a view of its appropriate value today, say 14 times $10 million equals $140 million. The use of comparables is a common technique used widely in practice and is often referred to in the financial media, for example when discussing the adequacy of a takeover bid for a listed company. 
These types of comments can, be, can seem quite reasonable and convincing as ways of getting some understanding of the value of a firm. They feel like they make sense. However, none of these types of comments that appear regularly in the financial media when discussing various takeover bids of listed companies and other transactions involving the purchase and sale of businesses gives us any further insights into the economic and business realities of these firms. They do not help us connect to reality. Although aspects of a firm's financial statements are referred to, for example earnings, there is no focus on using aspects of the financial statements to help us connect to the firm's economic and business drivers, to what is really going on. Remember, accounting numbers are merely passengers, not the real drivers. These approaches give us no insights into what is driving value for a firm. No insights into value. Price is what you pay. Value is what you get. Warren Buffett. The approach of using comparables, while commonly used in practice, has nothing to do with conducting a fundamental analysis of the value of a firm. It simply represents a cop-out from us doing our own analysis, which will involve us using financial statements and other information to engage with the economic and business realities of a firm for ourselves. Using comparables is largely an exercise in thinking about what others might pay in the future, which can be essentially a speculative activity. As Warren Buffett, a student of Benjamin Graham, has said, price is what you pay, value is what you get. The latest share price of a listed company represents the current opinion of the marginal investor in that company about the value of that business. This is not my opinion, but someone else's opinion. They may or may not base that opinion on a sound understanding or engagement with the firm's economic and business realities. Indeed, the use of comparables as a way of assessing the value of a firm involves the logical fallacy of relying on the share price of listed company comparables as a fair estimate of their value to assess whether the current share price of another listed company is a fair estimate of its value. This is a circular process. Speculation is based on me thinking about what you are thinking, about what I am thinking, about what you are thinking. It is not grounded in a sound, intelligent assessment of the realities of a firm. This logical fallacy does not apply to assessing the value of private firms, as these firms do not themselves have a listed share price. Another issue with the use of comparables as a way of assessing the value of a firm is the difficulty of finding comparables that are sufficiently like the firm we are assessing. This is quite an issue, as no two businesses are identical. Each business will have its own unique distinguishing features. Also, the multiples of listed comparable companies can vary greatly between themselves. The use of comparables, although widely referred to and used in capital markets and with seeming apparent common sense and reasonableness, provides little or no insight to forming a view of the value of a business. This is because it provides no assistance in helping us connect to the economic and business realities of a firm we are analysing. It may help us assess what other people might be prepared to pay for a firm. It may also be useful to convince other parties, an internal investment committee we may be seeking to convince about the merits of an investment proposal, the party from which we are seeking to acquire equity in a firm, or perhaps a financial journalist. In my opinion, the use of comparables should never be used to convince ourselves about the value of a firm. There are many approaches used in practice in our capital markets to analyse and value firms, including the use of comparables. If these approaches lack theoretical rigour, what should be a rational, theoretically sound basis 
for assessing a firm's value. The only theoretical basis anyone has managed to identify for valuing the equity of firms is to look at what an equity interest in a firm entitles us to, which are the future dividends we could expect to receive. We now consider this view of assessing a firm's value. 3.4 Forecasting Dividends, Cash Flows or Earnings Many of our strategies start with the premise that companies create economic value mainly by earning returns above their cost of capital. Andrew Lacey, Lazard Asset Management Accounting is the language of finance. It is the means of recording through Arabic numerals the forces and values that represent everyday business transactions. That is why we live in a world of mathematics, why Arabic figures have become so tremendously important in a business civilization based upon competition, the profit economy, and perhaps some growing degree of national capitalism. Here is the resurrection of the philosophy of Pythagoras, which applies more to the business civilization of today than it did 500 years before Christ when Pythagoras flourished on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. Roy Fulk. Methods and approaches which use financial statements to help us connect with the realities of firms can give us an edge over those analysts who primarily use methods and approaches that do not. This section looks at approaches using forecasts of dividends, cash flows or earnings as ways to help us use a firm's financial statements to engage meaningfully with the economic and business realities of a firm. Discounted dividends. An equity interest in a firm entitles us to a stream of future dividends for the rest of the life of the firm. If, for example, the firm is liquidated or taken over at the end of its life, this would include a final dividend representing the remaining assets after all liabilities of the firm have been settled, or a payment to the equity investors from the party taking over the firm. That is what an equity interest entitles you to. Nothing more and nothing less. The equity value of a firm is the present value of expected future dividends. Equity value equals PV of expected future dividends. This all seems straightforward. However, we are not going to start using various mathematical expressions to dis we are now going to start using various mathematical expressions to describe some ideas and concepts. Pythagoras, about two and a half thousand years ago, thought that all things were numbers. He thought that the divine principles of the universe, though unable to be perceived by our senses, can be expressed in the relationships of numbers. Accounting is all about numbers and we will be expressing several key relationships between accounting numbers by way of mathematical expressions. They can be expressed in words, but it is possible to express these relationships more briefly and precisely in mathematical terms. Some people relate to numbers better than others. Either way, you will need to take time com coming to grips with the various mathematical expressions we will be using. Now, equity value equals PV of expected future dividends. This can be expressed as equity value equals div1 divided by rho e plus div2 divided by rho e squared plus div3 divided by rho e cubed plus dot dot dot, where div little t equals expected future dividends each year. Subscript t refers to the year. Row E equals cost of equity capital. This is the discount rate incorporating the opportunity cost of our capital which we incur while waiting for the future dividends to arrive in our bank accounts each year. If the cost of equity capital is 10%, it is calculated as 1 plus 0 0.10, which is 1.1. This is called the dividend discount DD model. It is the theoretical basis for us to value equity in a firm. That is, forecast the dividends to eternity 
that we expect to receive and discount them to the present by applying a suitable discount rate. I've expressed the equity value based on assuming dividends will be received forever, which is for eternity. That is what the three dots at the end of the expression above mean. This is not realistic. Although some firms can last a long time, all firms can be expected to have a finite life and to be liquidated or taken over one day. For this reason, we would need to include a terminating dividend at some point. If we could, in practice, value equity using this approach, financial statement analysis would focus on predicting a firm's future dividends. Although dividends are the appropriate theoretical construct to use in considering the value of equity in a firm, it is what equity investors in a firm will get, after all. They are generally not able to be used in practice to value equity in a firm. The key difficulty in forecasting dividends is that dividends are not the source of value for equity investors. Rather, they are simply a transfer of value between a firm and its equity investors. For example, a firm may decide to increase its dividend payout ratio, the proportion of earnings that will be distributed to its ordinary shareholders, from 10% of earnings to 90% of earnings. Assuming no change to earnings, this would result in dividends increasing by nine times. Does that now mean the equity in the firm is worth nine times what it was worth prior to the change in dividend policy? That does not seem to make much sense. Nothing has necessarily changed concerning the economic and business realities the firm is facing. For example, the market for its products and services, the actions of competitors, government regulations and taxation, and so forth. The only thing that has changed is that the board of directors of the firm has held a meeting and decided to increase the proportion of profits it pays to equity investors as dividends. It is not obvious how this action by itself can add value. The key practical difficulty of valuing equity in a firm using a discounted dividend DD model is that it is difficult to forecast a firm's future dividend policy to eternity or to the end of a firm's life. This is because it is based on the discretion of a firm's management and board of directors who may consider a range of factors in making their decisions. Also, a firm will typically have a range of transactions between itself and its equity investors that are not simply limited to the regular payment of cash dividends by a firm to its equity investors. These will include the issue of new shares and share buybacks, the repurchase of its own shares by a firm from its existing equity investors. Cash can move either way between a firm and its equity investors. For convenience, we will use the term dividends to represent net dividends, which will include any transaction between a firm and its equity investors. To value the equity of a firm in practice, we will need to move in behind the dividends a firm pays its equity investors. We will need to engage with the economic and business realities of a firm that are driving the future creation of value by the firm for its equity investors, rather than simply focus on the transfer of value from the firm to its equity investors by way of dividends. One way to do this is to focus on the cash flows a firm generates from its operating activities. Discounted cash flows. Dividends and cash flows are related. This relationship can be expressed like this. Dividends, D, equals operating cash flow, C, minus capital outlays, I, plus net cash flow from debt owners, F. Remember that our idea of dividends is net dividends, meaning it is the net payments to equity investors in a firm. It would include dividends paid to equity investors, new issues of shares, share buybacks, indeed any transaction between a firm and its equity investors. Operating cash flow is the cash generated by a firm's operating activities. 
essentially cash received from selling goods and services, less the cash expenses incurred to generate these cash inflows from sales, for example, salaries, advertising and rent. Capital outlays are the cash invested into the operating assets of a firm that generate products or services for sale. For example, new factories, new retirement villages, additional inventory or a new warehouse. Less the cash generated by selling operating assets, for example, selling some surplus land or an old factory. The operating cash flow C, less capital outlays I, is known as the free cash flow, FCF. Thus, free cash flow, FCF, equals operating cash flow C minus cash outlays I. FCF equals C minus I. We use the letter I to represent capital outlays because it is the net cash investment into a firm's operating assets. The words cash flow can refer to several different things. Cash flow can refer to operating cash flow, C, to free cash flow, FCF, to financing cash flows such as net cash flow from debt owners, F, or to various earnings based measures used to approximate cash flow such as EBITDA, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation and amortisation. In this study guide, the words cash flow will usually refer to free cash flow, FCF. If a firm had no debt or borrowings, dividends, that is the net cash flow between a firm and its equity investors, would simply equal a firm's free cash flow, that is its operating cash flow less capital outlays. However, usually a firm does have some borrowings. Net cash flow to debt owners would include interest payments to and from a firm, as well as new issues of debt and repayment of debt by a firm. In this way, dividends will depend on a firm's free cash flow, FCF, and on the level of net cash flow from debt owners. Another way of saying this is that the source of net dividends to equity investors is a firm's free cash flow, FCF and its net cash flow from debt owners. In this way, dividends to equity investors are sourced either from a firm's free cash flow from its operating activities or from net borrowings from the debt markets. In 2022, Ryman Healthcare paid its equity investors a dividend of $112 million in cash and bought back $2.8 million of its shares to give a total dividend or net transfers between a firm and its equity investors of $114.8 million. However, its free cash flow in 2022 was negative $185.4 million. So how did Ryman Healthcare pay a dividend, that is net cash flow to its equity investors, of $114.8 million? The only way it could was by increasing its borrowings or more accurately, it's net cash flow from debt owners, which includes net payments by $300.2 million, which is what it did. Our relationship between dividends and cash flows can be expressed like this. Dividends D equals operating cash flow C minus capital outlays I plus net cash flow from debt owners F which equals free cash flow, FCF, plus net cash flow from debt owners, F, i.e. D equals FCF plus F. Rearranging this expression, free cash flow, FCF equals dividends, D minus net cash flow from debt owners, F, i.e. free cash flow equals D minus F. This expression indicates where the free cash flow FCF of a firm goes or where it is applied to net transfers or payments to equity investors and to debt owners. There is a relationship between a firm's dividends, its net cash payments to its equity investors and its free cash flow from its operating activities. For this reason, 
It is possible to focus on cash flows rather than dividends when valuing equity in a firm. A valuation of the equity in a firm based on discounting future free cash flows, DCF, of a firm draws on the same theoretical base as a valuation based on discounting future dividends, DD. Namely, the value of equity is the present value of expected future dividends. However, by recasting dividends in terms of free cash flow, FCF, there is a key practical advantage. We no longer need to predict the dividend policy of a firm. This is because whatever the dividend policy a firm adopts, it will have no impact on the value of equity using a discounted cash flow approach, DCF. That feels good on two fronts. Firstly, there is one less thing to forecast, that is there is no need to attempt the difficult task of forecasting a firm's dividend policy. And secondly, it makes sense that a firm's dividend policy should not affect the value of equity, as it is simply how much of a firm's earnings will be transferred to equity holders rather than be used, for example, to pay off debt. Finance theory suggests there are situations where such financial decisions should have no relevance to the value of a firm itself. We can use the discounted cash flow DCF approach to value a firm or the firm's operations or the enterprise. We can then value the equity by deducting the value of debt. We can recast the dividend discount model to focus on calculating the present value of cash flow. Equity value equals div1 divided by rho e plus div2 divided by rho e squared plus div3 divided by rho e cubed plus dot dot dot, which equals c minus i1, it's div equals c minus i, c minus i1 divided by the weighted average cost of capital, which is um, the cost of capital for operations, plus c minus i2 divided by WAC squared, plus c minus i3 divided by WAC cubed, plus dot dot dot, minus the value of debt. And remember that free cash flow equals c minus i Free cash flow little t equals c minus i little t, which equals d minus f. Free cash flow is dividends d minus net cash flow for debt owners f. If we forecast free cash flow instead of dividends, we are ignoring the effect of debt, or in other words, we are valuing a firm's operations independently of how it is financed with debt or equity. We use WAC, the cost of capital for a firm or for its operations, rather than row E, the cost of equity capital, as the discount rate. We do this because discounting a firm's free cash flow gives us the value of a firm's operations or its enterprise value. We then deduct the value of debt to give us the value of equity. To value the equity of a firm using the discounted cash flow DCF method, we need to forecast free cash flow over several years, say three to five years. Adopt a simplifying assumption to value free cash flow beyond the forecast period adopted, and then discount the free cash flows to a present value. This is easier to do than forecasting dividends, as we do not need to forecast a firm's dividend policy. However, forecasting free cash flows does suffer from some of the same practical problems as forecasting dividends. The key problem is that free cash flow, like dividends, is not a measure of value creation. Rather, it is also a measure of transfer of value. Dividends are a transfer of value from a firm to its equity investors. This transfer of value can be affected by a firm's dividend policy, or in other words, by what mixture of debt and equity it decides to use to finance its operations. Similarly, free cash flow, FCF, is a transfer of value within a firm. It is a transfer of value between a firm's operating and financial activities. 
Free cash flow, FCF, is driven by two things. Cash flow from operations, C, and net cash invested into a firm's operating assets, I. The dividends paid to equity investors by a firm can be affected by a firm's dividend policy. That is by how much value is transferred to equity investors in any given year. This is a financial decision of the firm and one which should not necessarily affect the value of a firm. In a similar way, the amount of free cash flow a firm generates will be affected by a firm's decision as to how to invest into its operating assets, I. The more a firm invests into its operating assets, the less will be a firm's free cash flow, FCF, and other things being equal, the less will be the value of a firm under a discounted cash flow DCF approach. This does not seem to make much sense. Management of the firm are presumably investing in operating assets because they expect them to add value to equity investors. That is, they are expected to earn greater than the cost of the capital used to acquire them, rather than be value destroying. In 2022, Ryman Healthcare had operating income after tax, OI, of $713.6 million. This came from its operations in developing and managing retirement villages and rest homes in New Zealand and Australia. However, in 2022, Ryman Healthcare also invested a net $899 million into its operating assets, change in net operating assets as the result of a major building program of retirement villages and rest homes. Ryman Healthcare's free cash flow, FCF, in 2022 was negative $185.4 million. That is $713.6 million minus $889 million. Free cash flow equals operating income minus change in net operating assets. However, if Ryman Healthcare had not invested so much in developing new retirement villages and rest homes, say only invested 600 million rather than 889 million, it could increase its free cash flow FCF from negative $185.4 million to positive $103.6 million. If Ryman Healthcare had in fact done this in 2022, by cutting back on its level of investment into its operating assets, would it mean the value of Ryman Healthcare would increase as a result? Quite the reverse. If you think its investment into operating assets is likely to provide a strong return, that is add value to equity investors. This is a significant practical problem in using a discounted cash flow model to value a firm. Fundamentally, Free cash flow is a measure of transfer of value rather than creation of value. To value the equity of a firm in practice, we need to engage with the economic and business realities of a firm that are driving the future creation of value by the firm for its equity investors. We can get closer to these by focusing on economic profit that is on the generation of earnings over and above the opportunity cost of the capital it is using to generate those returns. Economic profit. The opening book value of equity plus expected comprehensive income, less expected dividends, equals the expected closing book value of equity. This can be expressed as follows. BV book value one equals BV zero plus CI1 minus DIV1. This simply means that the book value of equity in any year can only be increased from the previous year's level by earning comprehensive income CI or be reduced by the amount of net dividends paid to its equity investors. This includes all cash flows between a firm and its equity investors, that is share issues, share buybacks and dividends. This can also be expressed as div1 equals bv0 minus bv1 plus c1, ci1. We know that the DD model values equity as the present value of expected future dividends, 
This can be expressed as the value of equity, VE, equals div1 divided by row E plus div2 divided by row E squared plus div3 divided by row E cubed plus dot 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 plus div little t divided by row E to the power t. Substituting div1 equals BV0 minus BV1 plus CI1, we can then uh, adjust the formula as set out in the reading. And then skipping over the precise algebra, this can be re-expressed as the value of equity equals book value O plus abnormal earnings AE1 divided by row E plus AE2 divided by row E squared plus A plus dot 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 plus AE little t divided by row E to the power t plus BV little t divided by row E to the power t. This is where AE little t equals abnormal earnings in year t, which equals CIT minus rho E minus 1 all times BV book value t minus 1. And abnormal earnings AE is the difference between comprehensive income, a measure of the accounting earnings of a firm, and the cost of the capital the firm uses to earn that return. This in turn can be expressed as Value of equity equals book value 0 plus AOI 1 divided by WAC plus AOI 2 divided by WAC squared plus dot 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 plus AOI little t divided by WAC to the power t plus BVT divided by WAC to the power t where AOI little t equals abnormal operating income in year t which equals operating income T minus WAC minus 1 times BVT minus 1. Close all brackets. And WAC, weighted average cost of capital, or the cost of capital for a firm's operations. Operating income is the earnings on a firm's total assets or enterprise, independent of how it is funded by debt or equity. That is, it is before deducting interest and is after deducting tax. The value of equity under the discounted dividend DD model, based on the present value of expected future dividends, can be re-expressed as the book value of equity plus the present value of future abnormal earnings plus the present value of the book value of equity at period time t. Alternatively, this can be expressed as the present value of future abnormal operating income plus the present value of the book value of equity at period time t. As period time t becomes a long time into the future, then the present value of the book value of equity at period time t becomes very small and can be ignored. This means the value of equity equals the VE equals book value BV0 plus the present value of abnormal earnings. Or alternatively, value VE equals the BV0 plus the present value of abnormal operating income. It is possible to focus on cash flow or on earnings rather than dividends. This draws on the same theoretical base as the discounted dividend model. The value of equity is the present value of expected future dividends. However, by recasting dividends in terms of abnormal earnings or abnormal operating income, there are some practical advantages. We no longer need to be concerned that the value of a firm will be affected by its dividend policy, nor by the amount of its operating cash flow it reinvests into its operating activities. We can focus our attention and our efforts in analysing a firm's financial statements on those aspects that are potentially adding value. This should help us more effectively engage with the economic and business realities of a firm. Conclusions. We have the ancient Greeks to thank for coming up with the idea of ratios. However, it has only been over the past hundred years or so as financial statements have become increasingly available and the analysis of financial statements more widespread, that the use of this idea of ratios has been applied to financial statement analysis. Over the past hundred years, 
there has developed a wide variety of practices to analyse financial statements to value equity interests in firms. This is because there is no general agreement on an appropriate theory for financial statement analysis that can be readily implemented in practice. We've looked at some of the ways in which people actually go about analysing financial statements in the early part of the 21st century, often adopting a range of approaches with a common focus typically being on the relationship between listed share prices and a firm's earnings, PE ratios. We have seen that much of what is practised as analysis of financial statements may not in fact be part of a fundamental analysis of a firm. Reliance even in part on listed share prices of companies when analysing a firm and its financial statements is focusing attention on what others think about the value of a firm, not on what we think. At the end of the day, there are many ways to assess value. Different techniques and approaches, such as a quick check of multiples of comparable listed companies, can have their place to play in different situations. However, using approaches to financial statement analysis based on sound theory about how a firm adds value to equity investors will help us focus our financial statement analysis on those aspects that will help us to better understand how a firm adds value. The key to doing financial statement analysis well is to understand this better than most other investors, to know what adds value. We also saw there is general agreement about one thing, that in theory, the equity value of a firm is the present value of future dividends. We also noted the dividend conundrum Value to equity investors is based on future dividends, but observed dividends do not tell us anything about value because they are a transfer of value between a firm and its equity investors and are affected by a firm's dividend policy. We saw that dividends, cash flow and earnings are related in the financial statements and that it is possible to focus on cash flow or economic profit rather than on dividends. In this way, we can focus our attention and our efforts on analysing those aspects of a firm's financial statements that seek to represent activities of the firm that are adding value to shareholders. In the next chapter, we will start to look at how we might do this.